Thank you. As I was indicating to you, I think that this is a letter to uh, Mr. Hodgman, and you can move to the next one, Mr. Uh, Harris. That was B90, the highlight. That's B90. It's an effort to make it clear for you. B91. You can now see what's happened here. That we, the letter, the lines have been blown up so you can see them more clearly. And I will, you'll be able to see them yourself. I don't have to read those, I don't think. B92A, B92B, B93A. Now, this one, if I might stop for a moment. This would be one that's very important, and I'd like to read this. The stomach contents of Ms. Nicole Brown Simpson were not saved. And uh, you will hear testimony during the trial that if they, if the, the proper procedure for any coroner's office in the United States, they wanted to determine with some accuracy the time of death would be to save the stomach contents. In this case, the coroner's office threw those stomach contents away. We will never have those. May I proceed, Mr. Harris, please? B93B, B94A, B94B. This has to do with the mislabeling of a sample regarding Mr. Goldman. You may move on, Mr. Harris. B95A, B95B. It's another mislabeling or inadvertence. Move on, Mr. Harris, please. B96A. This has to do with a procedure which was violated by the coroner's office, which they acknowledge in this letter. Uh, after being separately dried, the panties and dress were wrapped together rather than separately. Mr. Harris, thank you. B97A, B97B. This has to do with the media, the ever-present media. We'll move on. B98A, B98B. It's an interesting one with regard to uh, a recommendation that it would be desirable to perform a response team on complex cases by adding a pathologist, criminalist, and a coroner's photographer to the coroner's investigator and transport persons routinely assigned to respond. 99A, 99B. This one um, called to your attention also that the coroner's office response team was not allowed access to the decedents by LAPD until approximately 10 hours after the LAPD's arrival at the scene. That will become, we think, important in the evidence, and we will um, share with you a transcript of a conversation between one of the detectives in charge when the call was first made and asking them not to come out at that time. Our experts will testify that if one wanted to determine the time of death, the coroner's office needs to be called as soon as possible to respond to the team. Mr. Harris, sir? B-100A, B-100B. Mr. Harris, you may move on. B-101A, B-101B. Mr. Harris? B-102A. B-102B. Fluoroscopy would have been desirable. Apparently it was not done in this case. B-103A. B-103B. Indication that photographic prints should have been made by the Sheriff's Department rather than LAPD, the coroner's office being an agency of the County of Los Angeles. B-104A. B-104B. Hi, Mr. Harris. B105A. B105B. Mr. Harris. 
Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Harris. We finished that one. Now, ladies and gentlemen, as I indicated to you, what you've just seen and what we expect to be the evidence is that those are basically amendments to the coroner's report brought about after this conversation and meeting between the L.A. County coroner who did the uh, autopsy here, uh, Dr. Golden, his boss, boss, Dr. Lakshmanan, and then our experts. Now, we expect that when Dr. Baden is called to testify in this case, uh, to make a number of findings because he was there, he did was able to review all these records and expect the evidence to show while we're talking about coroners that he will testify that the injuries and bruises on Mr. Ronald Goldman's hands indicate that he had struck uh, his assailant and yet there, uh, and this, there was a fight, a major fight uh, prior to his death. That uh, proper forensic procedures uh, would preserve the stomach contents of the deceased as I've indicated to you that in this case, there was no rape or semen kit analysis performed. And we would expect that he would, the expert would testify that a semen rape kit analysis is standard procedure for coroner's offices in the United States at this time in June of 1994. He will also testify, I believe, that a closer to the time of death, one takes the temperature of a victim, their liver mortis and their rigor mortis, is the likelihood of an accurate result increases, and that's very important. He will say also, I believe, that the killings would have resulted in an enormous amount of loss of blood. And of course, you've seen that, that evidence of which would be expected to be on the perpetrator. He would have expected the person who committed these horrible crimes would be covered with blood. Dr. Baden and along his colleague also Dr. Wolf examined histology samples and pointed out to the coroner's office a bruising of the brain that Dr. Golden had missed. They pointed out some findings that their coroner's office had actually missed and they, they advised him and let them know. There was then a supplemental report filed regarding that also. Dr. Baden, as the expert, will testify that the LA County Coroner's Office violated their own procedures in performing these two autopsies. He will indicate further that the autopsy findings in this case are consistent with the struggle that resulted in hand-to-hand -hand combat. That Mr. Goldman did in fact bleed profusely and he bled slowly and that he was standing through most of this. And that in his opinion, the perpetrator would be covered with Mr. Goldman's blood. He also, Dr. Baden will testify that there are blood drops on the back of Ms. Nicole Brown Simpson, and there were no swabs taken. In fact, when the body was moved and taken to the lab, those blood drops, which very well may have been of the perpetrator, were wiped off or washed off, never preserved. And so, what I expect the evidence to show through our testimony and through cross-examination, as I've indicated, that the coroner's investigators who came to that scene also didn't wear any covering over their shoes. But, uh, we expect you'll be able to see that this scene was tracked through and traipsed through by the coroner's people, just as it had been by the LAPD people. And at some time in this trial, we hope to have some graphic video evidence of that fact to you, so you can see for yourself. But in short, what, from our standpoint, from the defense standpoint, in wanting a fair trial, being able to defend our clients, the actions of the coroner's office has obviously made everyone's job, and specifically the defense's job much more difficult. That when the LAPD failed to notify the coroner's office for 10 hours in violating the state law, it made everybody's job more difficult. That Dr. Golan, if and when he testifies, as he testified at the preliminary hearing, when asked questions as to whether or not there could have been two knives used in these two killings, would indicate that some of the wounds on these two victims are consistent with uh, a double-edged knife, some are consistent with a single edge knife or blade. So it would be consistent that perhaps two knives were used. And I think that um, we can expect that uh, from his testimony either by the people or by us if he is called to so testify. In addition to Dr. Michael Baden, we will have for you to testify Dr. Henry Lee. 
the foremost, foremost forensic crime scene analyst in America. He is head of the state of Connecticut lab. He'll be here to share with you his findings with regard to this crime scene and what took place at that crime scene and the contamination of the evidence thereof. Now, with regard to the opening statement yesterday, as I said, you were told that uh, in this case, uh, the coroner's office uh, couldn't do any better than three hours. And I think that with the evidence we've, we've shown you, we're going to show that uh, they could have done an awful lot better. And we'll have other cases to cite for that. I've covered with you this morning the question of the timeline. And we'll talk about that at the very end again. Ms. Clark talks about a trail of blood where there is no trail. And we will expect to have evidence showing that whereas she told you yesterday, time and time again, that they were looking for matches to exclude, to exclude, to exclude, that what she did not tell you was that there are trails that lead toward innocence, and they were not pursued. Let me give you some examples based upon the evidence that I expect to produce in this trial. There is, and I'll go through this uh, list for you. Expect the evidence to show that there was blood under Miss Nicole Brown Simpson's fingernails. It came back a type B in an EAP genetic marker. And that does not fit the genetic profile of Mr. Simpson, Mr. Goldman, or Miss Brown. Some other person. That there was blood found on Miss Nicole Brown Simpson's thigh. And that came back also for type B. There was, as you might imagine in this case, all kinds of evidence that come forward, people who want to volunteer things. There was a knife found shortly after these killings. And the blood on one of the knives found also was this type B, similar to the blood that was found under Ms. Nicole Brown Simpson's fingernails. You would expect that blood would be of the perpetrator since it's not hers. We will, in a short time, show you a graphic of, of several things in that connection. Uh, there were identifiable fingerprints, which not match and don't match Mr. O.J. Simpson, or any of the police officers there. And this becomes relevant, we think, because the contention of the prosecution is that one of the gloves was lost in this struggle, supposedly. There are identifiable palm prints. It's no match to Mr. O.J. Simpson. Our experts will testify there are different patterns of shoe imprints at this scene, indicating perhaps more than one person. No mention of that thus far. We expect that to be the testimony. There are no hairs on the Bundy glove that are match to Mr. O.J. Simpson. There are Negroid hairs on the knit cap at Bundy that do not match Mr. O.J. Simpson. But the prosecution has never, to this date, done any DNA tests, as we know, as far as we know, rather, on the Bundy glove. Testing has been slow. That when the investigators arrived at the scene of these double murders, she talked to you about uh, somebody named Detective Risky. Well, Risky may have been the officer who came there, but this case was assigned to Phillips and Furman. This was their case. This is West Los Angeles homicide. Phillips and Furman. That it was transferred from them because of the high profile nature of the case to robbery homicide thereafter. But Phillips and Furman continue to play an active role in this case. You will hear very, very little about an officer Risky. But one of the interesting things I think you'll find about this crime scene is the dearth or lack of any photographs, examination, or investigation inside that house. I don't think you'll find one photograph from inside that house. There will be some evidence that the officers who arrived at that uh, scene, shortly after finding these bodies, found a partially melting 
cup of ice cream from Ben and Jerry's. We don't have that. Uh, I don't know that there were no pictures taken of it. So we, have to, we don't have any way of seeing how much it was melted. Uh, we're precluded from that at this point. This was found near the back of the residence of the Bundy home. You heard a lot yesterday about blood drops at Bundy. Well, as you can tell, there are obviously thousands and thousands of drops of blood at that scene. Ms. Clark talked to you about five blood drops. But we expect the evidence to show that the blood drops that they found had very, very little DNA. And the graphic uh, soon I will try to demonstrate for you the amount of the DNA found in these blood drops, which meant that these blood drops, according to our experts, were either old or degraded, contaminated by people who collected them and tested them. And of course, the blood drops at Bundy are in, in an area where Mr. Simpson and his children have obviously been on many occasions. There were tire tracks in the back of the house which have not been matched to any of Mr. O.J. Simpson's vehicle. Now, one of the things that we expect to show during the course of this our presentation of evidence is that there was, in fact, a major struggle. And Mr. Goldman fought valiantly. He was apparently physically fit, 5'10 and 170 plus. He was stabbed a number of times, perhaps 30. And there was blood on his hands and arms. He had a number of defensive wounds. And the experts will testify that you would expect that the perpetrators, that Mr. Goldman's blood would be all over the perpetrator's clothes, hair, all over his body. In fact, he would be saturated with Mr. Goldman's blood. And of course, under the prosecution's theory, the perpetrator was driving that Bronco that night. And there's no evidence of Goldman's or Nicole uh, Simpson's bloodstains inside that Bronco, of the, of the amount that you would expect, uh, given this situation, that the pattern of blood that they talked about yesterday, the small, small, very small pattern of blood in that vehicle is very consistent with what I expect you will hear is a statement made by Mr. Simpson. Now, Ms. Clark went on yesterday and said that um, with regard to the DNA evidence, she talked a little bit about DNA. She didn't talk about or make a distinction for you between the RFLP, the Restriction Fragment Length Polymorphism, or the polymerase chain reaction, the PCR, of which our expert uh, basically invented it. But I think what you'll find is this is very, very sensitive evidence that is then Xeroxed up, molecular Xeroxing. And we'll talk about that a little more later. We think the evidence will show that the pattern before I tell you that, I think the evidence will also show that on the steering column of the Bronco, item number 29, the people's exhibits, I don't think you were told this yesterday, that they did not talk about a DNA mixture consistent with, consistent with, not necessarily a match, consistent with Mr. Simpson and someone other than Nicole or Ronald Goldman, some other person. That with regard to Rockingham, Mr. Simpson's residence. Again, I expect there will be testimony that Mr. Simpson did, in fact, cut his finger in some place where I'm pointing now, near the end of this middle finger. And he so told the police that evening, on January 13th, and that he went out, he did it either as he's about to leave or whatever, he went out to the Bronco to get his cellular phone. That what I think you will find and what I think the evidence will show is that the reason there was no blood coming up the stairs, and this carpet in this house, I think you'll find the evidence will show, is largely white, largely very light. If you have a jury view, you'll be able to see it for yourself. You didn't find any blood other than what you saw 
outside and just in that entryway. And I think you'll find that leads toward the kitchen. And there will undoubtedly be testimony with regard to that uh, injury, if any occurring, before he ever left for Chicago. There will be, as I understand the evidence, no trace of blood on the white carpet, upstairs or up on the stairs or upstairs. No trace of white of blood on the white carpet from any bloody shoes. No trace of blood on the white carpet from any bloody pants or shirts. And no trace of blood on this white carpet from any bloody socks. The evidence will show that the, in an effort to find any evidence, not to exclude, but to include Mr. Simpson. They searched everywhere in the area in Los Angeles. They searched in Chicago. They searched everywhere they possibly could think. And they did not find any weapon or any clothes because Mr. Simpson, the evidence will show, did not have one. They took apart traps and pipes from his sink, showers and plumbing, and searched everywhere for these various things. The evidence will also show that with regard to Ms. Nicole Brown Simpson. Mr. Hodgman. Yes, sir, I'm ready to coach. All right. I should point out that the people in their investigation did, in fact, check the, think the sink area and the, the shower area and some areas in the bathroom um, for in the bathroom floor for areas for an indication there may be blood uh, in those areas. Some of those tests came back positive. There will be testimony. Uh, there will be testimony with regard to this entire area as to those tests and what other things will test positive for. The court will, at the appropriate time, allow this to be discussed. Now, uh, we'll see. Thank you. With regard to uh, Ms. Nicole Brown Simpson, which I was about to talk about, the testimony, we believe the evidence will be that because of the nature of her injuries, uh, a lot of blood came forth. So that the perpetrator would, in all likelihood, be covered and soaked again uh, with her blood. Uh, we think this will become important again when you determine the absence or lack of blood, certainly with regard to Mr. Simpson, not perhaps regarding the, the perpetrators of, these, of this offense. Ms. Clark yesterday talked about a mysterious disappearing black bag. Uh, we expect there will be videos in this case that the black bag I presume she was talking about was Mr. Simpson brought back with him from Chicago. It can be seen clearly with that video, with that black bag. And I believe it was in police custody, certainly at one point. I know they had it in their custody. And so it didn't seem to us that's a big mystery, but we'll have to look at the evidence as it develops. But uh, we're not aware of any missing black bag that Mr. Simpson has or whatever. So looking at the evidence at, uh, at Rockingham, uh, and then there's this Rockingham glove that's supposedly found in an area that you saw some pictures about yesterday. Mr. Simpson's home is a very, very narrow pathway on the side of his house. You saw the pictures of these, this, this glove, which was on top of some leaves. There will be no testimony, as I understand it, about any blood drops leading to and from that. But as I expect the evidence will show, there's a fence right up there close by this blood drop. This pathway leads basically to a backyard area that's kind of basically enclosed. I think there's maybe a gate on one side. I think the evidence will show if somebody wanted to come in the house on that side, and you'll see this when you go out there, there are at least two doors on that side that somebody could go right inside the house by climbing over a fence or anything of that nature. 
you will see the evidence, and again, you will be the one who can help make those facts. But with regard to this glove, which was, and then again, again, I think that, uh, let me try to set the record straight for you, this glove was not found by them or the officers or whatever. This glove was found by Detective Furman. He found it, and he then individually took these other officers back there supposedly to see it. But they had supposedly brought a photographer over there to take pictures of it. And although you didn't hear that yesterday, that, those are the facts as I understand them. As I said, there's no blood trail to these leaves. The leaves don't appear to be uh, disturbed. There's no evidence of any hairs, or fibers on this fence. And there was testimony, and will be testimony, I believe, that there are cobwebs in this area beyond this glove. Presumably, one could infer that nobody had been back there for some period of time and knocked those cobwebs down. With regard to this glove, there's also on this glove a Caucasian hair on this glove that does not match the hair of either Nicole Brown Simpson or Ryan Goldman. And Ms. Clark told you yesterday that how samples are collected and who collects them are unimportant. I alluded to this briefly, but we think that the evidence will show that the Nobel Peace Prize winner who invented this technology will tell you it is of paramount importance how this is collected because of the sensitive nature, how very small you can't even see some of these samples. You'll hear that testimony from Dr. Kerry Mullis. You will also hear testimony from a Dr. John Gertis, another leading expert from Denver, who we expect will come to testify. It seems to me that any attempt to, in the evidence, to make it seem as though PCR technology and DNA and RFLP is easy, easy to understand. It's very complex. I think from both sides, we want to do everything we can to make this as clear as possible. I think that you will hear testimony, and I ask you, of course, to keep an open mind as you hear the experts on both sides, and I think you'll get a, a clear picture of this particular evidence. I mentioned before this crime scene and the number of people who were allowed to walk through there, many with just their shoes on walking right through the blood, some who had those little booties on, some had gloves, some didn't have gloves, picking up the evidence, which will become very relevant and important to you as you hear from the experts about the contamination aspect of this and what it means, how easy it is, a sneeze, a touch, whatever, for this evidence to become contaminated. You'll hear about this uh, new technology. But you'll hear also that the expert who invented it doesn't believe it's being properly and appropriately applied, and it's not ready, perhaps, in a forensic sense to be used. That is, to be used at a crime scene and then brought to court. So when Ms. Clark talked to you yesterday about the medical uses of it, she talked about amniocentesis, and that was nice. But in amniocentesis, you have known individuals you know who the father and the mother are. At least you better know who they are. I was hoping that, that when you take the, the fluid, you know that. In a lab, a clean setting, it's not like a crime scene or whatever, you will hear the distinction. As I said before, this 21st century cyberspace technology used by people poorly trained in the field. We're using like 19th century uh, techniques to collect it. Ms. Clark mentioned to us about yesterday about Jurassic Park. This is not a movie. This is not, you can't, and it would be fantasy to think that you could take and make dinosaurs with DNA. Nobody's done that. That's a movie. It's not real life. She talked to us about the czars in Russia and that sort of thing. Well, it's one thing to look for bones. There is a technology that you hear about was not used in this case. It's a different technology altogether, some kind of sequential DNA testing. Mitochondrial, and I won't bore you with the term. That's not used, but the experts will tell you. That's not relevant to the proceedings here, what was done here. So with regard to the claim that every effort was made to exclude Mr. Simpson, we think the evidence will show that that's not what happened in this case. We have to keep an open mind. We think the evidence will show that when test results pointed away from Mr. Simpson, they concluded that something must be wrong with the test. 
our experts will tell you that there are huge interpretation problems with many of the tests performed in this case. This is particularly true where there are mixed samples containing blood or other biological material from more than one person. We expect to show that the results of some of the tests in this case are so ambiguous that two different scientists will come to two different conclusions with the same results. As I said earlier, given Mr. Simpson's statement to the police, the evidence of anything, any blood in the Bronco, is far more consistent, we believe, the evidence will show with Mr. Simpson's innocence than any guilt. And the fact that there's almost no blood of anyone else, if any, in that Bronco is just the opposite of what you'd expect if somebody committed a crime and used that vehicle as a means of transportation. Now, to conclude then with regard to uh, my discussion of Ms. Clark's opening statement, a number of things were said to you yesterday, and Judge Ito at the end of the day asked you to keep an open mind. As I thought about this case last night, I was concerned, just for a moment, as I thought about, well, we didn't get a chance to talk to them yet through circumstances beyond our control. But what quickly came to my mind was the fact that a jury that we've tried to work and pick since September has been so patient would keep an open mind. And I'm sure you've done that. That's all we're asking. But not only from last night to today, but until you hear the end of the case. Because you remember, and part of what I'm saying to you today, is that the case won't be over until you've heard all the evidence and the summations by the lawyers. And all of you have said that would be unfair to make up your mind before that. And I think both sides would agree with that. So in her conclusion yesterday, she'd indicated that uh, something about it was devastating, proof of something other, if you remember. It seems to me, as I thought about what she said, that the fact that there <coughs> is no blood where there should be blood is devastating evidence of innocence. And we'll be talking more about this, that the fact that blood voluntarily given by a defendant mysteriously disappears when it should be there is devastating ev evidence that something is wrong. And finally, it seems to me that the fact that blood mysteriously appears on vital pieces of evidence and it's predicted what the results will, will be regarding DNA when that evidence is still in the police lab is devastating evidence of something far more sinister. Now let's turn our attention again, if we could, to the laser disc showings. Let me start this part of the presentation quickly by showing you again some trails that lead to innocence that weren't pursued by the prosecution team. And, uh, Your Honor, I'll be moving ahead. And we'll call out the number. Before we do that, Mr. Mr. Uh, Douglas, can you receive, can you retrieve the envelope? Yes, with the court reporter, please. <coughs> Thank you. 
All right. Thank you, Madam Reporter. Mr. Cochran, you may continue. Thank you very kindly, Your Honor. I think we were, just before we get to the disc showings, I, I just would indicate to you that I expect there will be evidence, as I've indicated to you somewhat already. There was a, an intensive search in Mr. Simpson's home looking for any kind of a weapon, uh, presumably a knife of any kind. And I think that during the course of the trial, there will be evidence that will become very relevant to you with regard to uh, this entire area and the people's theory with regard uh, to knives. Now, we have now move on, Your Honor, to um, report uh, dealing with the uh, fingernail uh, clippings. B1A. I had talked to you earlier about this um, analyzed evidence report. And this is the actual report of the substance found under Ms. Nicole Brown Simpson's fingernails. What 84A and 84B, I think the 18A is a typo, could not have come from Nicole Brown Simpson, Ronald Goldman, or O.J. Simpson, as I indicated to you earlier. Thank you, Mr. Harris. D2A, and we have to uh, uh, There is a, the next photograph is it's coming up. May I have just one second? You need the reporter. All right. Record. Thank you, Counsel. Thank you, Your Honor. So there's a record, Your Honor. Uh, Mr. Uh, Douglas has indicated to me I need to read um, uh, these, the graphics into the record. I'm not sure that our court report is getting all these. It's item 84A and 84B. It says 18A, which I understand is a typo, could not have come from, quote, Nicole Brown Simpson, Ronald Goldman, or O.J. Simpson. Now, there's, a, there's another. The, the next one coming up, I was going to ask Ms. Clark. You may want to hit your kill switch on this next one, just briefly. All right. This uh, next photograph is what I alluded to earlier of the blood on Ms. Nicole Brown Simpson's back, and it's an indication that testimony is from our expert that this blood on her back in that position was, in fact, never preserved, neither by the LAPD nor the coroner's office, and was, in fact, wiped off uh, and never preserved or saved. Thank you, Mr. Harris. To conclude, then, um, Ms. Clark's opening statement, I'd like now to move to a discussion of what I expect the evidence to show vis-a-vis -vis the defense in this matter. You may have asked yourself, in hearing this evidence this far, who, then, is O.J. Simpson? 
That's an answer that will come, hopefully, during the course of this trial. I can tell you that the evidence will show that he is a 47-year-old man, father of four. In many respects, he's the living embodiment of the American dream. I think that you will hear testimony and evidence about certain other things you don't know about O.J. Simpson that may become relevant during these proceedings. There will be testimony that O.J. Simpson suffers with chronic rheumatoid arthritis. He's one of the leading rheumatoid arthritis doctors in the country. And that when he's in remission, he can function fairly well. But when it's an acute phase, he has great trouble functioning. We expect there will be testimony that on the date of June 12, Mr. Simpson was involved in the acute phase of his rheumatoid arthritis. And on that date, after he had played golf, the problems with his hands were so severe he could not shuffle the cards where he played gin rummy at the country club thereafter. We expect that will be, the evidence will be adduced. You will hear from several of his doctors who are on our witness list to further buttress the fact that he was in an acute phase of this rheumatoid arthritis shortly after he came into custody. Mr. Simpson had surgery in which some lymph nodes were removed. These lymph nodes were caused by the rheumatoid arthritis, contain white blood cells. In addition to that, I alluded to the fact earlier that he was perhaps the greatest running back in the history of the NFL, with all kind of records. But you pay a price, and the evidence will talk about that price that he paid. On his left knee, he's had four surgeries. We expect you'll hear from his doctor about the effect of those four surgeries, about the effect of what he has in addition to the chronic or acute rheumatoid arthritis, he has osteoarthritis in his legs. The evidence will be he suffers with rheumatoid arthritis in both of his wrists. And so things are not as they always seem. And as you see him sitting there now, he does, in fact, have problems with movement. There will be testimony that he plays golf, that he can no longer play tennis, that when he plays golf, he always has to use a golf court can't walk 18 holes. We expect there'll be testimony that he's perhaps one of the only few people in the world who's able to use a golf court at Pebble Beach because his doctor had to write such a letter. And so I'd like to demonstrate that for you, the extent of his knees, and say to you that what no NFL, National Football League defense could do Mother Nature and Father Time have taken their toll. Doesn't mean he can't move around, but I think there'll be evidence of the limitations now imposed upon him by virtue of his career, by virtue of these, this disease that he suffers. And I'd like at this point to have Mr. Simpson come over to the jury so I can demonstrate the problem with his knees. I could with Ms. Deputy McNair. All right, ladies and gentlemen in the back row, if you want to stand up, feel free to do so. Mr. Simpson is demonstrating for the jurors, demonstrating for the jurors his left knee, and I think there's an indication that there are scars going um, uh, up and down, and sideways, and there's one behind, I think, and one in the front. I think there's an indication that he's had at least four surgeries on that particular knee. Uh, while you are here, Mr. Simpson, I would like for him, Your Honor, to be able to choose to show his, um, not your wrist, but um, his um, middle finger of his left hand, Your Honor. Yes. I um, can't mark this in the exhibit, but I can at least do what the court allows me to do. I want to show his middle finger of his uh, left hand. Well, 
let me caution the photographers to use extreme caution. Yes, sir. All right, thank you, Council. In addition to what you've just seen with regard to his left knee and the condition I told you about, Mr. Simpson is dyslexic. He suffered with dyslexia all of his life. And you know what that is, where he tends to, when reading, things get reversed and transposed and backwards, despite all of that. As I've said, you see what he's done with his life. I think the next area we'll deal with, and Mr. Douglas will put the um, diagrams up. You've heard and will hear testimony that on the evening of June 12th, 1994, Mr. Simpson had a trip planned to Chicago, Illinois on American Airlines. The plane was due to leave at about 11.45, and in fact, it did leave around that time. Mr. Simpson got to the airport, got on the plane, yeah, and what we seek to illustrate here is his demeanor and all the people on the plane and their relevance to this particular case. We expect there will be testimony that he was one of the last people to board the plane that particular evening as he headed east to go to Chicago. That he took a seat, and he was fortunate enough to be sitting in first class, and that sitting very close to him, a young man by the name of Steve Valerie, whom I believe you will hear testimony about. Steve Valerie was very impressed that he was sitting next to O.J. Simpson. So he had occasion to watch Mr. O.J. Simpson, watch his hands, I'll tell you, he didn't see any major cuts on his hands or anything of that nature. But he observed his demeanor, observed how he acted, observed how he handled himself during that particular time. That there was a man on this flight by the name of Holly Bing, a man famous in his own right. He's Muhammad Ali's personal photographer, he lives here in Los Angeles. And Muhammad, that Howard Bingham was on his way to see Muhammad Ali. He left his seat back here and walked up had a conversation with Mr. O.J. Simpson. He, too, will come in and tell you how Mr. Simpson appeared on June 12, 1994, 11.45 to the time that flight got there to Chicago. And there are others, as you might imagine, who've seen him. Particular interest is there's a captain of this flight, Captain Wayne Stansfield, found out that O.J. Simpson was flying to Chicago. And he came out of the cockpit. You know, you always worry when you see the pilot come out. But I mean, that presumably means there are a couple others who can fly the plane. So he came out, and he got Mr. O.J. Simpson's autograph on the flight log. So he had a chance to see his hands, had a chance to observe him. He signed autographs as he got out of the limousine for the Skycaps. Remember, he'd gotten some money so he could give the Skycaps some money. There'll be testimony that he had $10 or whatever. The Skycap had no change, and he gave him that, of course. And you'll hear about this flight. You will hear about this man's demeanor. You'll hear about how he handled himself, how people watched him during this period of time. Mr. Valerie especially was looking at his hands because he thought that O.J. Simpson would have a championship ring on his hands. So he had occasion to look at him, watch him, observe him, as did Howard Baker, who knew him before this time, as did the pilot, and as did all the other people uh, who came in contact with him. Thank you, Mr. Dudley. The next graphic we think will be relevant to you in the course of the presentation of the evidence. This time, as you can see from the graphic, Your Honor, what's, we're not getting numbers, The first one was 203. This is 204. Referring to number 204, and you can see the legend is we're going from east to west this time. This is after the evidence will show Mr. Simpson has been told that his ex-wife has been found murdered. And you will see the difference in this man's demeanor and how he reacted and how he handled himself. From the time he got that call from Detective Phillips, he found out that 
his ex-wife had been murdered. And how he reacted, what he said, his concern about his children, how he called and tried to get the first flight out of Chicago, how they had a flight too late for him at 10 o'clock or something. He insisted on an earlier flight. He wanted to come directly back to Los Angeles as soon as possible after this conversation. He made calls while on the way back from Chicago to Los Angeles to try and find out what had happened. And we'll be calling certainly more than one witness on that flight. It's very interesting. See right next to O.J. Simpson on this flight back. There's a lawyer by the name of Mark Partridge. Mark Partridge sat with him the entire time. He will come in here, he's a lawyer in Chicago, and tell you about this man's demeanor. One of the interesting things about this, I think you'll find, is that whereas Mr. Simpson had no cuts on his hand in the knuckle area that anybody saw that we know of going, when he came back, he had a cut, which you just saw, remnants on, on his knuckle in the middle finger. Mr. Partridge saw that. There will be testimony that in the hotel room in Chicago, there was a broken glass, shards of glass in that hotel room. There was blood associated with that glass and with the towel therein. His whole demeanor, as you might expect, had changed. He suffered a terrible loss and took the first flight back from Chicago here. We think that Mark Partridge, along with other people who may be called, will be re very, very relevant in the course of this case. Now, as depressed as he was, people who came in contact with him still didn't know about his tragedy. And people would still come up and ask him for autographs during this period of time. But he did get back to Los Angeles sometime that day, and he went, we think the evidence will show, directly to his home on Rockingham where he was first of all placed under hand, in handcuffs, then they were taken off, and then he was asked if he wanted to come downtown and talk to the police, maybe not ask Toll, if you come downtown and talk to the detectives in this case, Van Adder and Lang. Voluntarily did that. He had a lawyer there by the name of Howard Weitzman, one of our more prominent lawyers here in Los Angeles. He had his business lawyer, Skip Taft, but he came home. There were no police at the airport. He came back home. He went downtown. They talked to him in the car on the way downtown. And when they got down, when they got downtown, he doesn't know what I'm going to say. I, I don't know. Well, the council wanted to get around a little bit, too. We can have an offer of proof. My objection now. Why don't you approach without the reporter, please? Thank you, Council. Mr. Carpin. Thank you for counting, Your Honor. Sorry for the interruption again. When Mr. O.J. Simpson, as I said, returned home at his residence, he went downtown with the police detectives. He had two lawyers who followed him downtown. Howard Weitzman, noted lawyer, and his business lawyer, Mr. Skip Tapp. We think the evidence will show that Mr. Simpson got downtown his two lawyers will testify, or at least one of them will, that he was told, they were told by the police that they could not be present when Mr. Simpson was interviewed. And Mr. Simpson, and, that there will be a, and the evidence will be, if that happened, that's wrong, it will be a violation. But Mr. Simpson went ahead and talked to the police without discussing any contents with his lawyers, not in the room, and away. They went someplace else until this interview, some 33 minutes, had concluded. We expect that's what the evidence will show uh, in that regard. In this connection, we expect there will be testimony and evidence 
from a number of witnesses of things that happened that week, not the least of which will be a gentleman by the name of Al Collings. We expect that Mr. Collings, a very dear friend of Mr. Simpson's, will testify, along with others, about the events of the date of June 17, 1994, the low-speed pursuit that you all indicate you've heard, heard so much about. We expect there'll be testimony about that, that when Mr. Cowling spoke to the police, they were headed north on the 405 back to Mr. Simpson's home, that on that particular date, among other things, Mr. Simpson had been heavily medicated after the funeral that week, that he wrote some letters, that he called his first wife, Marguerite Simpson, among others, and his family members, and that he insisted to those who would listen that the events of the week Not offered by the adverse party counsel. Let me let me rephrase that. We had a number of conversations with people who were very close to him that week. And I expect the evidence will be that you will hear what he was saying, what his state of mind was, and what triggered this low speed pursuit. I expect you'll hear from Mr. Cowlings. They'd gone down to Orange County to his wife's grave. And that, when the police encountered him, heading north on the 405, they were heading back to the Rockingham address, and that he, in fact, ended up there. One of the things that I would like now to turn is a photograph I'd like to alert counsel to. next exhibit is a photograph of Mr. Ronald Goldman's hand. And you will see, and you've heard I've indicated to you that there'll be expert testimony from forensic pathologists that the bruises there are an indication that Mr. Goldman's hand and fist came in contact with the perpetrator, that there was blunt force trauma, and that he was able to strike uh, his assailant. There will be other testimony with regard to other wounds on his hand. I think that's relevant because I would like next to have Mr. Harris move to the next photographs. What's the number on that one? D13. When Mr. Simpson returned to Los Angeles on June 13th, The pictures you're about to see now are pictures taken of his body on June 15, 1994, and June 17. These first ones are from June 15, which was a Wednesday. It's Mr. Simpson, and I want you, hold that a minute, Mr. Mr. Harris. I want you to look at Mr. Simpson's face in this picture. Other than looking more morose, look at his face in the photograph with his daughter, Sydney. What's the number? Number 200. And this photograph here. We expect that the evidence will be there are no bruises on his face or on his body. This picture was taken on June 15, 1994. Mr. Harris, will you go to the next photograph, please? D16, D16, another shot of Mr. Simpson's body. D20, D21, 
21. The right arm. C22. The right hand and part of the forearm. C23. It's the left hand. Now this photograph of the testimony will be, this photograph was taken on Friday, June 17th, and we think that the indication that blood had been taken from him that day by one of his doctors I talked to you about is his arth arthritic uh, doctor, and his other doctor is, is osteo um, arthritic doctor, and his also his orthopod had taken blood from him that day. This is a picture of his right arm. Mr. Simpson's back. Mr. Simpson's face and teeth. It's a picture of, uh, a revealing picture of Mr. Simpson, however, but to show his entire body. Mr. Simpson's hand. And just on D30, you can see that kind of circular mark there, which you saw a faint mark there. We expect there will be testimony that with regard to that particular mark there on his middle finger, that there will be testimony among the doctors on our witness list that that is in no way a knife cut, that is more consistent with uh, a, some glass or some shards of glass having made that particular cut. 331. 332. 333. C-34, C-35. Is that it? All right. Now, to conclude this particular portion of uh, our discussion, we expect there will be other evidence of demeanor and pictures. We expect that Although we've heard the police wanted to exclude Mr. Simpson, that when they talk to him on the 12th, I don't think you'll see any pictures taken of his body, except the one picture she showed you yesterday of his hand. But we wanted to use, know that there are other pictures. It's part of our part of the case. We have these pictures. We wanted to share them with you. Now, Your Honor, we, I'm now about to turn my attention to the LAPD and its lab. It may be, uh, I do not now believe with all the interruptions I'm going to be able to finish today as much as I wanted to so that whatever your honest pleasure is, I, there, there's a, this next portion is, is fairly lengthy. Well, counsel, I leave it to your professional discretion. Do you think this is an appropriate breaking point? Yes, let me just take a look here. I think that it is. I'd like to make just a couple statements that I think that it is. If I might. Proceed. Thank you very kindly, Your Honor. I'm sorry I'm not going to be able to finish today, ladies and gentlemen, but you can understand the importance of this case to both sides. I've had a number of interruptions, and I'm sorry it's taken longer. But I'm sure you'd expect nothing less from either side of the lawyers from either side in this case. Tomorrow we'll come back and we will start talking about the police investigation. We'll go through some charts, which hopefully will make the whole subject of DNA a little less complex and confusing. We will talk about the so-called evidence flow in this case. The, one of the factors, and we'll start at the very beginning of the police investigation and work our way through to determine what they did and how they did it and how it impacts upon this case. The important piece of information that we think the evidence will show, however, is that all of this evidence collected, whether at Bundy or Rockingham or wherever, went through the LAPD lab. And we expect to introduce evidence that from their own records, that laboratory is a cesspool of contamination not up to speed, not up to standard. We think we can conclusively indicate that during the course of the testimony in this case. Thank you very much, and I would ask you to keep an open mind until tomorrow until we have a chance to finish. Thank you very much.
All right, ladies and gentlemen, as far as the jury is concerned, then we're going to take our recess for the afternoon. Please remember my admonition to you. Don't discuss the case amongst yourselves. Form any opinions about the case. Don't talk to anybody about the case, nor allow yourself to be approached or spoken to with regard to the case. And we will resume again, hopefully, with the conclusion of the opening statements uh, tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. As soon as the opening statements have been concluded, I anticipate that we will be calling the first witnesses tomorrow morning uh, within moments after the conclusion of the opening statements. We'll just take a recess long enough to take down the easels and things, and then we'll start with the actual presentation uh, of the witnesses' testimony for you tomorrow. All right, have a pleasant evening. And ladies and gentlemen, uh, counsel, let me uh, ask you to stay behind because we need to put a few things on the record before we conclude for the afternoon. All right, let's clear the courtroom. On. So it's really used, so you're saying this it's is, used for impeachment. This is coming in as, as impeachment after the prosecution has presented its uh, searching officers? Yes. Mr. Heisman, as to that item. Your Honor, I share the court's reaction in terms of rolling the eyes. First of all, there is only one report which has been available to the prosecution. The court knows that. I double-checked as recently as two weeks ago just to be sure and obtain another copy. All right. I was we, mistaken in my assumption that uh, that, had, that had been turned over because I recall some report having been turned over to you with regard to that. So I had assumed that that was everything. My mistake. Okay. The, the problem is, Your Honor, is we have what occurred this afternoon, and that is very, very prejudicial to the people. I don't think I need to explain that any further in terms of that demonstration. Uh, for dramatic effect and prejudicial effect to the people. We're going to ask that the court admonish the jury to disregard that. We ask that any reference to that be stricken. We ask that the defense not be allowed to produce or utilize that item in any fashion whatsoever. And, Your Honor, we will be asking, in addition for a little bit of time, to think of other discussion. Dis excuse me. I'm I need to slow down myself a little bit, Your Honor. Give me just a moment. Yesterday, the, or the other day, the court said it had to take a deep breath. Allow me to take one, too. I took a deep breath, decided it's time I should take a recess, and then I decided I should go home. I don't know. Some of the pundits criticized me for taking time on making up my mind. I don't know. But, Mr. Your Honor, the, the court is absolutely accurate in the sense that we have some discovery items of concern and that, that deserve discussion this afternoon. In counsel's opening statement today, there has been reference, and I, I have a laundry list here, but there has been reference to... Okay, well, let's, let's deal with them one at a time. I have a number of witnesses that were mentioned that I have some concern about, but let's, let's deal with the uh, envelope, its contents, and the reports relating to it. Uh, what is your response? What is your response specifically to Mr. Shapiro's uh, argument that uh, I, I agree with you, I'm, I'm concerned about its use, the envelope's use, during the course of opening statement. Um, but what is your response to Mr. Shapiro's argument that since it is going to be presented uh, as an impeachment item, and unfortunately, uh, well, I mean, you know from the report what the item is from uh, Dr. Lee and uh, Dr. Sugiyama's report as to what the item is. So that's not a mystery. We know what the item is, Your Honor, but as far as the stated purpose, I mean, that is something that I believe uh, occurred on Shifting Sands this afternoon. We're going to ask for a hearing with regard to any utilization of uh, the envelope, the contents of the envelope, um, and we certainly ask for what I've requested thus far. That is an admonition to the right, jury. Well, let, me ask, let me ask you this, Mr. Hodgman. The issue, the, just as far as the envelope and its contents, you know what it is. Um, you know that it was an item sought by the police, by the investigating officers in their search warrant, and that they did not, in fact, recover it. Your Honor, we don't know the circumstances of the recovery Why of not? that item. I don't. It, and to state, to state. No, no, Ms. Ho Mr. Hodgman, I'm stating known fact. You were uh, the. You know what is in the envelope from the report from the two doctors, or the criminalist and the doctor. You know that it was an item 
that was originally sought or something similar to it was sought in a search warrant, correct? I know that items like that, that particular item, Your Honor, I don't know the source, I don't know the circumstances okay. so of the assume, recovery. Let's assume we're talking about the same thing. I can't make that assumption, Your Honor. I don't know until right. we no, get discovery no. of the circumstances of the recovery of that item. I mean, we are completely in the dark. And what, Your Honor, again, I, I'm going to go well, back no, to the here's, basic. Here's the point. The point, though, is they're saying they don't have to disclose it because it's impeachment evidence, that it's going to come during the course of the cross-examination of the police officers that you're going to call serving the search warrant and seizing evidence. What's your response to that? My response, Your Honor, is That's that the issue. it has been disclosed. We want an opportunity to be able to uh, have a hearing on this and litigate it. Our, my position right now is that item should be simply suppressed. Now, we have a stated purpose from counsel this afternoon, but that should not have been forthcoming in an opening statement. Not at all, Your Honor. Uh, Mr. Shapiro, I'm, I'm concerned, though, that you've sort of waived certain confidentiality as to what it is by its use or its attempted use in opening statement. Wouldn't you agree? No, Your Honor, uh, I respectfully disagree. There was never any intention to open it. The only intention was to tell the jury something very simply, that the police have not done a proper job in investigating this case. And it started at the beginning and it went to the end. And even though they had two search warrants to search a location and to look for a particular item, as directed by two judges, that their incompetence was so gross that they overlooked a potential key item of evidence, and we will point that out as impeaching evidence of the officers who were in charge of this search. We were, not going to, we were not going to open it. We were not going to describe its contents. We were not going to mention where it came from. We were simply going to say that the evidence will show that the Los Angeles Police Department had directions from two judges to look for something. All right. Well, the value in not having to disclose something that you're going to use for impeachment purposes is obvious. <coughs> the problem is uh, you've created a problem by bringing the envelope out. I agree Mr. Hodgman's entitled to a hearing before the item is actually opened, and we will have that hearing at the time that the defense intends to uh, present that prior to that. We would also uh, ask the court to inquire what grounds there are for the people to suppress an item of impeachment. Well, they've asked, they've asked for a hearing. I'm On indicated. what grounds? Well, I have no idea. I'm sure between now and two months from now when it's actually presented. Uh, no, it may be presented as early as tomorrow, depending on what witnesses they call. Could be. We'll see. Well, prior to its presentation, we will hold a hearing outside of the presence of the jury as to what it is. They're entitled to know what it is before you use it, but not to prepare their witnesses. Well, they know what it is. Why well, know They've what it is. They've already stated yeah. that. Right. Yeah. Okay. All right. You're now, as to the name, so the issue, the issue will remain unresolved until the matter actually comes up for presentation, because I think that's the time to litigate that issue. But you're on notice that it's there. We're on notice that it's there, but we are still completely in the dark. The people are completely in the dark as to the circumstances of the recovery. We may know what it is, Your Honor, mm -hmm. but counsel has information and is making allusions well, this afternoon. Mr. Hodgman, let me suggest you do this, though. My understanding of the law of impeachment is they're not required to disclose it until they want to use it, if it's impeachment evidence. If you have some evidence out of the law of discovery that's contrary to that, let me know tomorrow. If you've got some cases to the contrary, let me know. Also, I think perhaps it might help Mr. Hodgman if this item was not recovered by us, but it was recovered by a retired judge in the court's direction. Well, we, okay. Your Honor, we are still unaware of the circumstances of where, when this item was recovered. We don't know. The people have never known. Council apparently knows. And it was this whole uh, arrangement no, was done at the request Mr. of the Hodgman, defense. Mr. Hodgman, it's obviously a discovery issue. The question is, are you entitled to know about their impeachment evidence before they present it, until just before they present it? My reading of the law of discovery is the answer to that question is no, if it's impeachment. If you have some authority to the contrary, let me know tomorrow. All right, I've directed Mr. Cochran 
I gave the envelope back to Mrs. Robertson, directed him not to use it in his opening statement. So that's where we stand. And with okay. regard to that, Your Honor, again, we repeat our request for an admonition no, to the don't, jury. You don't need to repeat it. Thank you. Very well. Okay, let's go Witnesses. to Gatch. I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Cochran, you're going to have to spell his name for me. Uh, which one, Your Honor? Gatches? Gitch? Uh, is it Marion Gurches? Gurches. I think it's uh, Marion. <clears throat> G-E-R-C-H-A-S. When you bring up something like that, the court reporter would be thrilled if you spelled it. Yeah. All right, thank you. Mr. Douglas, are you going to address these discovery issues regarding witnesses? I'm going to try, Your Honor. All right. The court is well aware that we have been working diligently in this manner. The court is equally aware that the work in this case has been divided among a couple of offices and investigators, et cetera. It perhaps is regrettable that I stand before this court that we have not coordinated all of our defense efforts as well as I would have liked before this point. I say that because, Your Honor, I have some documents that I do intend to give over to the people. As the court has encouraged both last night and before, I have had a, a law clerk working from mid-morning on yesterday preparing to provide documents and any witness statements on this matter. One of the items I forgot to do this morning was to ask for your report this morning. And that is what I'm doing right now, Your Honor. All right. My mistake. By way of background, just so that I could lend some scope to what our efforts have involved, I have in my own office 16 notebooks of different witness statements. They are primarily statements that were provided by discovery given me by the people. There were then efforts by my investigators to interview some of those witnesses at various occasions and there have been leads that have been derived from those interviews. At various times, there have been five different investigators working in various aspects on this case, reporting not only to my office, but to Mr. Shapiro's office as well. The normal process has been that duplicate copies of all investigative reports be submitted both to Mr. Shapiro's office and to our office as well. The normal process has been that I have worked very closely with Ms. Sarah Kaplan, Mr. Shapiro's office, mutually coordinating different discovery, mutually coordinating the preparation of different defense witness lists, and comparing what items would comply with the different aspects of discovery consistent with our interpretation of our obligation under the Discovery Act. I am prepared at this time because there has now been what I hope is a final search of all names that were on our witness list, not only on the recent witness list, but also on the list that was prepared in August of 1994. And we went through each of those 16 books, Your Honor, and we went through and pulled any defense reports. And this afternoon, I had Ms. Kaplan compare all of the reports that were sifted through and taken out of my notebooks with those documents that have been previously provided to the people. Uh, I have a stack of report, not a stack, I have probably 12 reports, 13 including the report of Ms. Gershaw. I will represent to the court as an officer of this court that Ms. Gershaw's statement I see for the first time only five minutes ago. It is a, a copy of a statement that was taken July of 1994. Your Honor, I acknowledge and I anticipate that there will be strenuous efforts to impugn both my personal integrity and the integrity of the defense team. I tell this court, looking the court straight in the eye with all seriousness, that it has been an oversight and I am embarrassed by it and I take full responsibility. It is my obligation as the coordinator of the evidence to be better on top of the witness flow and the preparation of statements and reports. It is my blame and my blame alone, and I take full responsibility. I am reminded by Mr. Cochran that Ms. Gertrude is an individual whom the people have been aware of because, as is at least our understanding, Ms. Gertrude was 
had contacted both the police department and the district attorney's office. However, Your Honor, I accept responsibility because her name was added to our list in July, I'm sorry, in August. There was a statement that was taken apparently from an investigator who we do not work hand in hand with each day. Uh, it does not excuse it, Your Honor, and I seek not to excuse it. I am only offering as an explanation. I am providing today the statement of Mary Ann Gertrude, and that is a statement that is signed by her fully within the, both the spirit and the letter of the Discovery Act, fully a document that we were obliged to turn over in August of 1994. I am also turning over a statement of Ms. Michelle Abdu Dran, which is dated June 24th of 1994. This is a, a second statement that should have been turned over in August. Right, but she is an individual, Your Honor, who is the former maid of Mr. Simpson, who was struck by Nicole Brown Simpson, who they are fully aware of. They have been interviewing different witnesses about the incidents and the, the circumstances giving rise to Ms. Brown Simpson striking Michelle Abdurin. So they are aware of her existence. All right, uh, Mr. Douglas, would you spell the name for me, please? Sure, Your Honor. A-B-U-D-R-A-H-M. I am turning over, Your Honor, a statement by, of a Rachel Berman, who is an eight-year-old, who accompanied the, the Simpson children and Nicole Brown Simpson, a person whom they are aware of. She accompanied them to Ben and Jerry's, if you will. And she accompanied them to Metzaluna. She is an eight-year-old. Her name was given only this Monday on our supplemental witness list. What's the date of that statement? That statement is June the 20th, 1994, Your Honor. Her mother's name has been on our witness list. The statement of the mother was earlier given. We decided only this week to call the child or to add the child on our witness list. I am turning over a statement dated July 31 or dated August the 1st concerning a July 31 interview of an Alex Castillo whom Ms. Kaplan informed me was not previously turned over. And what is Mr. Castillo's relevance? Mr. Castillo was an employee of Metaluna Restaurant. And he gives testimony or information concerning a supplemental report by Detective Tom Lang suggesting that he had given Mr. Goldman a beeper and denying saying. I am turning over right. an August 2, 19... Let me just, let me just clarify. Is this the uh, Brentwood uh, Mezzaluna of Beverly Hills? That's correct, Your Honor. Oh, which, which oh this is the Brentwood Mezzaluna. All right. Thank I'm you. Sorry. I am turning over a statement of Naradine, N-A-R-I-N-D-E-N, -E Singh. S-I-N-G-H. Mr. Singh is the owner of a newsstand new across the street from Metzaluna. Uh, he is on our witness list. It is simply talking about the existence of a video camera at his newsstand. He is on the witness list as just a precaution. Uh, what is the date of that statement? August the 2nd, 1994. I am turning over a report for Kevin Whelan, W-H-E, L-A-N. The report is dated August the 3rd, 1994. He works as a dispatcher with Network Courier Services, who speaks about a courier having called the dispatch and saying that the courier had obtained an autograph of O.J. Simpson on June the 12th, 1994 at 11.20 p.m. And the statement is, you'll never guess whose autograph I got, OJ's. I am turning over a statement, Your Honor, dated July 14th, 1994, of a Tony Parker. As the court will recall, I did not know on Monday whom Tony Parker was. As the court will further recall, I turned to Ms. Kaplan and she didn't know who he was. This is a statement that comes from one of our investigators. Mr. Parker is the owner of a white 1973 International Scout four-wheel drive, which was parked on Bundy, north of, of Darlington, on June the 11th through June the 13th, 1994. I am turning over, Your Honor, a two-page document.
document given from Mark Partridge. Mr. Partridge is the end of the lawyer and referred to by Mr. Correct, Your Honor. Cochran. Dated June 27, 1994, and there's a fax cover sheet dated June 25, 1994. I am turning over a report from Miss Rosita Rubin, R H E U B A N, dated August 23, 1994. She is connected with Rubin Motors, which was one of the impound yards, I think, that is involved in this case concerning A.C. Cowlings' Bronco. What's the date of that? August the 23rd, 1994. I am turning over another report for Paul Sunnyshine, S-O-N-E-N-S-H-I-N-E, -E, dated August 16th, 1994 concerning an interview that he had. He is an employee of Rubens and Pound Yard. And he talks about the fact that Mr. Cowlings's Bronco was left in an unsecured location. I am turning a report over dated July 20, 1994 of Mr. Thomas Tellerino, T-A-L-E-R-I-N-O. who talks about the fact that he was roller skating on June the 12th, 1994 on Bundy and he sees a man hiding in the bushes near 877 South Bundy who was not the defendant. I am turning over a report of Dr. Ronald, uh, Mr. Ronald Taylor dated June 22, 1994 who resides in Chicago, who said that Mr. Taylor had occasion on June 13th to see O.J. Simpson when Mr. Taylor arrived, when Mr. Simpson arrived in Chicago, that he shook his hands, exchanged a few pleasantries, observed his hands, and did not see any scratches or cuts, and how Mr. Simpson was very friendly and gracious but appeared tired from the flight. I am turning over a report dated July 19, 1994, from Mr. Jason Wood, who apparently worked for Air Touch Cellular located in Irvine, and who happened to call Mr. Simpson on his cellular phone um, on J June 17, 1994. I am also turning over a report of a Mr. Joel Pitkoff, P-I-T-C-O-F-F, -F, dated August 24th, 1994. Mr. Pitkoff, Mr. Pitkoff is a research and analyst manager of the Ford Motor Company, and this is a report testifying or stating that for the 10-month period from October 93 through July 94, 26,688 Ford Broncos were sold nationally. 20,012 were sold in the first seven months of 1994. How many white ones? Your Honor, this report does not break down the number of white ones. Okay. And those are the statements that I can say now with a stronger degree of confidence are all statements that are discoverable, that are obligated to be turned over. As I say, Your Honor, I take full responsibility for any um, failures to have fully complied before now. Mr. Douglas, how do you uh, suggest I deal with the objections that I'm going to hear from the prosecution as soon as I finish peeling them off the ceiling? I suspect, Your Honor, that the best way to deal with these objections is, one, to strongly admonish the defense as you probably will do. I think an, a, a second appropriate objection would be that when we get to the defendant's case, which will be likely in two months, if not longer, that you ask the people for the status of their investigative efforts as to these particular witnesses. That if the people can, can make a showing that they have failed or been unable to fully complete any investigation as to any of these individuals, after having two months or more to do so, 
that we be required to, to call these witnesses towards the end of our case. I think that that would be uh, a sanction that would be more consistent with the sanction that was earlier imposed on the prosecutor, but I think that my learned colleague might have some other thoughts in that regard. Your Honor, one, one voice. Yep. Under issue. Yep. Do you want to change court reporters at this point? Janet? As I said earlier, Your Honor, uh, since January the 1st of this year, I have been responsible for coordinating the evidence, for making sure that discovery has been fully complied with. Certainly, this turning over of documents today reflects a breach in the process. Uh, it is one that predates my current role, but one that I accept responsibility for because somebody has. I think, however, Your Honor, that when you take the totality of the circumstances, given the scope and the mountain of evidence in this case, given the number of witnesses on both individuals' witnesses' lists, given the time and the care and the effort that has obviously been placed into this case by both sides, that the court should fashion any sanction, if at all, that is measured, that is consistent with the court's knowledge that these are lawyers who don't play games, who don't play fast and loose with the rules, who perhaps both sides have made mistakes and errors. I see Mr. Darden smiling. I'm not, but I'm not. both sides have, have, have made mistakes. We are all human. I am not perfect, but there is no bad faith and I am surprised as anyone that there were these numbers of documents that had not been turned over previously. I, I have to say, Mr. Douglas, I've, I've had long experience with Mr. Hodgman. I've uh, known him as a, as a colleague and uh, as a trial lawyer, and I've, I've never seen the expressions on his face that I've seen today. Uh, Mr. Hodgman, uh, why don't you take a few deep breaths, and then we'll take a look at this. Uh, but I have to tell you that my suggestion to you is going to be as follows. This is a rather ro wide range of witnesses who cover a rather wide range of topics and wide range of issues. And I have to deal with these each individually because they're each in a different posture. One or two of these might be justified in an explanation uh, deciding to add them on the witness list and turn over the statement after, say, for example, the court's rulings on domestic violence. Some of these others, though, clearly go to whodunit issues. Um, say, for example, um, Tolerino, who was roller skating on Bundy that evening. Obviously, that's a different posture. I'm going to suggest to you that you go over this list, go over those individual statements which you have, which I'm not privy to, and see which ones, what sanctions you seek as to which delay in discovery, and present that to me in the morning. Your Honor, I'm going to ask for a little bit more. You know, it was considered by this court this morning uh, to have the resumption of televised coverage of this case. The court's interest, as I'm sure at least certain parties, was that this would be an opportunity for America, law students, law professors, and perhaps even people around the world to see how the system operates in America. I am sorry to say that we have a horrible breakdown. And while I appreciate Mr. Douglas falling on his sword this afternoon, I think he minimizes uh, the consequences and the depth of what has occurred here today. Your Honor, if the people, if the people on the day of opening statement were to unload discovery dated June, July, August of this year, I can only 
I can only imagine that the sanctions against the people would be severe. I don't intend to minimize this, and I encourage the court, do not minimize this at all. Your Honor, it is not only what was turned over this afternoon, which we will need time, and perhaps more than overnight, to examine. We are going to have to go through this and evaluate it in light of other evidence. I understand it's that, Mr. Hodgman. That's why I was suggesting that perhaps you ought to take the time, carefully evaluate what you have there, and if you want to come back on another day on Thursday or Friday to uh, argue the uh, issue of sanctions, we can take it up then. I'm just, I'm just offering that opportunity to you, because I think that would be a more efficient way to deal with it. Well, I agree that some time in order for us to evaluate would be a more efficient way to deal with it. But, Your Honor, we do not want to proceed with evidence until we've had not only an opportunity to view this discovery, but the remaining items that have been alluded to in Mr. Cochran's opening statement. I can go through a laundry list right now, but, Your Honor, I hope this is a file. This, up until today, this is the extent of the defense discovery to the people. Under California law, there's supposed to be reciprocal discovery. That's part of playing fair. That's part of playing the game fair. The people have been severely prejudiced today, Your Honor, severely prejudiced. This conduct is outrageous and unbelievable. Now, in Mr. Cochran's statement this afternoon, we have reference to uh, statements from Joe Stellini, Howard Weitzman, Skip Taft, uh, Ron Fitchman. We have a number of witnesses like that. On top of that, we have a myriad of representations as to the defendant's physical condition with regard to dyslexia. Where is the report? Arthritis of several different varieties. Where are the reports? Uh, an expert regarding shoes. Where are the reports? Uh, potential evidence regarding tire tracks. Where are the reports? The cut on his finger. They, he intends to present expert testimony. He said it this afternoon with regard to the nature of that cut and a possibility of where the defendant got it. Where is the report? Mr. Cochran refers to other photos, apparently other than what had been disclosed to the people. Where are the photos? He talks about having an expert testify that uh, trauma on Ron Goldman's hand uh, is consistent with a, surrey, a certain scenario. Where are the reports? All, we have all sorts of test results apparently conducted by the defense that have not been forthcoming. We have reference to uh, Ms. Walker, who has been giving information to the defense. I realize she's just recently retained, but Mr. Cochran is referring to findings, to data, to other material that have not been disclosed to the people. We have reference to testimony of Dr. Bodden and Dr. Lee. Where are the reports? The people don't have them, Your Honor. This is supposed, this is supposed to be a fair proceeding. Where are, where are the reports? There are, there are uh, witness statements which have been given to us which have redactions. We're going to be asking the court for a hearing with regard to the nature of the redactions so we can determine whether or not it was proper to even have those redactions. Your Honor, there is a myriad of issues that have been raised by the acts of the defense today, an absolute myriad of issues. The people need some time to digest this. I realize this comes at a difficult time in the proceedings, but I don't think in the history of jurisprudence have we ever had anything occur like what happened today in this courtroom. All right, Mr. Douglas, would you address the additional issues that Mr. Hodgman raises that... Uh, Sir, Your Honor. Your Honor. With all due respect to Mr. Hodgman, and he is a colleague whom I respect, he has never practiced law as a defense lawyer under Prop 115. There is a new way to practice law these days, and that way is, since reports are discoverable, Your Honor, reports are not automatically written. Perhaps the way that he's accustomed, whenever you talk to a doctor, a doctor writes a report and turns it over, and then it's discoverable. Your Honor, when I talk to Michael Botten, and Michael Botten gives me some ideas for an opening statement or talks about what is his theory of the case, we are not doing it writing faxes back and forth. We talk over the telephone and we present evidence. Mr. Cochran has been trying cases for 33 years. He doesn't need to have a report in order to say something in an opening statement. I can call Howard Weitzman, who is a colleague of mine on another case, 
and ask him, Mr. Weitzman, did they tell you to leave the room in that interview? And he said, yes. And can I call you as a witness? And he says, yes. And there is no report. I can talk to my client about a dear, dear friend, Joe Stellini, and say, what would Joe Stellini say? And he will tell me that Joe Stellini said that there was nothing going on, and I put his name on the witness list, and there is no report. Your Honor, I will fall on my sword, but I object to the insinuation that I am doing something untoward. I acknowledge, Your Honor, that I am not perfect. I acknowledge, Your Honor, that I have done something wrong. I stand before this court chaste, and I acknowledge that. But I have been a lawyer for 15 years, and I take my obligation seriously, and I take the accusations of the people very seriously. I do not practice law that way. I acknowledge when I'm wrong, but there has not been any maliciousness. This is not the most preposterous thing in jurisprudence. This is a mistake. This is a function of dealing with hundreds of witnesses and going to trial in seven months. This is a function of there being 12 lawyers, five investigators, 22,000 pages of evidence. These are slips through the proverbial crack. I accept it and I acknowledge it, but I object strongly to any impugning of my integrity or the integrity of any lawyers on this team. Thank you. Mr. Hodgman, how would you suggest we proceed at this point? Since the ball seems to be in your court, you're the aggrieved party, how do you want to proceed? I am the aggrieved party. The people, well, I am not your honor. The people are. You represent the aggrieved party. I certainly do. And the people are deeply aggrieved. Your honor, first of all, uh, we will provide to the court a case that says the, the defense cannot circumvent discovery laws in the manner suggested by Mr. Douglas. There is a case on point. We will provide it to the court. We'll let the case speak for itself. As far as Mr. Douglas well, goes. That was part of my, you expect me to believe that comment from the day before. I'm sorry? Never mind. Oh, I, in fact, I recall, yes, Your Honor. Yes, I think the court is familiar with the case. Your Honor, how do we proceed? We don't proceed at this point because we need an opportunity to deal with what has been unloaded right. on us. Counsel, what we are doing, we are breaking early today because of the juror's obligation. Let me suggest that we do this. Uh, do take the uh, evening hours to examine what has been presented to you. Um, do prepare whatever letter brief you feel is appropriate. Obviously, fax a copy to counsel. Uh, I think some of these witnesses obviously um, for example, the, uh, the Berman child, I think you're aware of, because I recall seeing something about that somewhere in the, some of these things may not be egregious errors of, of uh, discovery. Some of them may be very fundamental problems for the people's case uh, that you may not feel comfortable going forward without having some substantial investigation done. I understand that. But what I'm, what I'm asking you to do is take a few deep breaths, evaluate what you have, uh, evaluate the record from today, and then come with, come to me with a proposal as to how we proceed tomorrow morning. Your Honor. I just think it would be a more efficient way to do this. We will do that. What concerns me is what we don't have, what we have not been given. The court is familiar with the law. The court a couple of days ago uh, stated, you expect me to believe that. Now, Your Honor, this is just a question of fundamental fairness and fundamental fairness for the people. The people too. We have, we have. Well, Mr. Hodgman, I agree. I, I understand the point you're making. And what I'm suggesting to you is that in a coherent, witness by witness, item by item, you determine what your position is, because the sanctions for failure or delay in discovery are oftentimes very severe. And if you recall in our discussion from yesterday or the day before, your first position was preclusion, which is the last step the court can take after having, exhausting, having, after having exhausted all lesser remedies. So I want you to be very careful about how you do that, because if I preclude something and the Court of Appeal or somebody else decides that I've abused my discretion, oftentimes that's reversible error. And uh, there are enough landmines in this case already. So let me suggest that uh, that course of action to you. Thank you. <coughs> Your Honor, 
in addition to what the court suggests, we will review Mr. Cochran's statement this afternoon. I, I and understood that that was part of your comment. Very well, because we will be asking for an order that any such reports uh, be produced and forthwith. Which is why you have the real time, and I suspect you may unplug your computer and take it home with you tonight. It may be a long time before I get home tonight, Your Honor. Your Honor, we will do as you suggest. We will report back in the morning. I expect it's going to be a very long night. Uh, I also anticipate... Night. They're all long nights, Mr. Hodgman. Well, well, they are, but this one's going to be especially long. And, Your Honor, before we can proceed any further, uh, we need to evaluate this, and we need... Well, Your Honor, there... Like I said, a, Pandora, a Pandora's box of discovery issues has just been cracked open this afternoon. We're going to need time to evaluate. All right, counsel, just as a precaution, I'm going to direct Deputy Magnera to have the jury brought over at 10 rather than 9, so at least we at least have a running start to look at these issues and see if, how we frame them. I appreciate the court's optimism. 10 o'clock may be early, but... I'm always optimistic. You know. I, I, I know you're right. All right. All right. Any comment from uh, Mr. Cochran, Mr. Shapiro on the discovery issue? Mr. Douglas, I'm sorry. You're the discovery sword man. All right. We will stand in recess as far as counselor concerned until. Nine o'clock, and uh, Miss Childs, can I see you, please? Miss Childs. I was I was unaware of that. Well, that person is not presently within the jurisdiction of the court, so I don't know that there's anything I can do about that or would be inclined to at this point. Okay. All right, but well, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. It is defense, with defendant, defense counsel's witness. Perhaps the court would like to advise defense counsel of the advisability of a press conference of that nature, but perhaps not. I just thought you could know. Thank you. All right. Thank you, counsel.